Hey guys, welcome again. It's that time. Sports and shorts of sorts. It's Ren City doing his thing like we do every week. Like I said, episode 56 now. We getting up there, so let's do what we do as we do in every episode. We'll honor the people that wore the number. So let's jump to it. 56. There's some great players to wear 56 in sports, but perhaps the greatest of them all some consider the best defensive player ever in the NFL. I'm talking LT, not LaDainian Tomlinson. I'm talking Lawrence Taylor. He was a freak of nature. And his recklessness led to him being a dominant defender at the University of North Carolina. In his final season at Chapel Hill, Taylor would earn ACC Player of the Year as well as Unanimous All-American. This dominant play led many to think LT would go first overall in the 81 draft, but... A poll showed 26 of 28 GMs would select Taylor first. However, the Saints had the number one pick and a GM who was one of the two who would not take LT first. The Saints would take halfback George Rogers at number one overall. And the New York Giants would take Taylor at number two in front of a very raucous crowd who were super pumped. You can see why. <laughs> Taylor would entertain those fans with one of the best defensive rookie seasons ever. He... LT would win Defensive Rookie of the Year as well as NFL Defensive Player of the Year the same season. The only person to ever do so. He obviously made the Pro Bowl and first team All-Pro that season as well. His second season was shortened by a player's strike, but LT had one of the most memorable plays of his career that season, bringing a pick six back 97 yards against the Lions, showing off that athleticism. He'd again win Defensive Player of the Year that season, and then the following season, Coach Ray Perkins would take the job at University of Alabama, leaving Giants to replace him with the big tuna, Bill Parcells. Taylor was still putting up big numbers, but the Giants weren't winning, and this one was caused Taylor to jump over to the New Jersey Generals of the new USFL. Some guy named Donald Trump had given him an interest-free loan to help swing Taylor to leave the NFL for the USFL. This is a decision Taylor would re later regret, and he was still able to sign a big deal to stay with the Giants, but... Taylor had to pay that mill back to Trump. The Giants had to pay Trump a sum over the next five seasons, and LT got his deal. So a lot of going on there. The team was getting better, more playoff appearances, and this time LT had another memorable play, but this one was brutal. Tough to watch. You can YouTube it, but I don't recommend it. On Monday Night Football, Taylor sacked Redskins quarterback Joe Theismann. In the process, he inadvertently caused a compound fracture in Theismann's leg, ending Joe Theismann's career right there. You could hear LT screaming for the paramedics to attend to the QB. Theismann never blamed him for the injury. He doesn't have anything. Like, it was a freak injury, but he snapped the guy's leg. Ugh. The following season, like, Taylor had one of the best defensive seasons in the history of the NFL. You can see how many best here. He was solid. He led the league with 20 and a half sacks. He became one of just two defensive players to win the NFL MVP. And you'll never see that nowadays. <laughs> defensive players don't go get the MVP. It's all quarterbacks. The only other person, Alan Page, 1971, had wanted a defensive player and won MVP. But this fantastic season by Tor Lawrence Taylor was capped off with a Super Bowl 21 win over the Broncos. Following season, another strike. They liked the strike back then in the NFL. And then Taylor would cause a bit of a stir, you know. He crossed the picket line, not ideal. He explained his decision by saying, yo, the Giants are losing and I'm losing 60000 a week. So <laughs> you can see why, but there will be more to come why his attitude might have been that way. The Giants were looking to rebound the following season, and then Lawrence Taylor tested positive for cocaine and was suspended 30 days, being it was his second offense. He'd return to the team, have a great season. The next season, they'd get back to the Super Bowl. Super Bowl 25 was super close, and it looked like the Giants might lose it. Buffalo Bills kicker Scott Norwood lined up for the game-winning field goal, and you might have heard, wide right. So there you go. The Giants would win. Taylor gets a second Super Bowl ring of his career. And then as seasons began to go on, there was a dip in Taylor's play. As we know, Father Time is undefeated. He tears Achilles, and many thought his career was done. But he'd suit up the next season, help the Giants get back to winning ways, but he'd retire after a playoff, blow playoff blowout loss to the 49ers. And when he retired, and even today, people say he was the best defenseman or defender ever in the history of the NFL. His resume upon retirement, like I mentioned, those Super Bowl rings, NFL MVP, Defensive Player of the Year three times, eight first-team All-Pros, two second, ten-time Pro Bowler named the 1980s All-Decade Team, NFL's 75th Anniversary All-Time Team, the 100th Anniversary All-Time Team, inducted into the Giants' Ring of Honor, 
where his number 56 is also retired by the franchise. I mentioned his dominance in college. Taylor wore 98 at UNC. That's retired there. So <laughs> Lawrence Taylor was amazing, but I mentioned the cocaine issues. He did have some drug issues, and he was known for his partying lifestyle. He's been in the rehab, and people thought, yo, his, his drug choices and his incidents might keep him out of the Hall of Fame. Nah, he was a first ballot Hall of Famer. So, like I said, one of the best to ever play the game of football, Lawrence Taylor. We'll stick with defensive players, and the next 56 to get honored is a beast on the defensive line. I'm talking about Chris Dolman. He started at the University of Pittsburgh playing both linebacker and defensive end, leading to the Vikings drafting him fourth overall in the 85 draft. He started his career playing outside linebacker in the 3-4 defense, but around the time of his third NFL season, the Vikings defense switched to a 4-3, which allowed Dolman to move back to the defensive line and play end, and it really paid off for him. He'd lead the league in fumbles that season, and then he'd lead the league in sacks a few years later with a career-high 21 sacks. Dolman spent his first nine seasons in the NFL with the Vikings, making six Pro Bowls, two first-team All-Pros, two second-team All-Pros, he ended up playing with the Falcons and 49ers, earning two more Pro Bowl appearances before returning to Minnesota to call it a career. He had a great career, and he's loved in Minnesota. He's one of the 50 greatest Vikings there. He was inducted into the Vikings Ring of Honor. He was mentioned. He was inducted into the, or sorry, he was named to the NFL 90s All Decade Team. And this, all these accolades led to Chris Dolman getting inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. However. Sadly, he just passed away at the age of 58 back in 2020. He was diagnosed with uh, globlistoma. I probably butchered that, and he would die from the disease two years later. Brutal. Like I said, only 58 years old. Back to the linebacker position. We're going to the Patriots here. A true New England legend, number 56, Andre Tippett. Tippett was a tear at Iowa playing the linebacker position. He was part of some of the best defenses that school has ever seen, earning consensus All-American there. This led to the Patriots selecting Tippett in the second round of the 82 draft, and he was a huge part of some tough defenses in New England. After not registering a sack his rookie season, he was on the hunt for quarterbacks. He recorded the two high, or the highest two-season sack total by a linebacker in NFL history. From 1984 to 85, he had 35 sacks over that span. One of the best pass-rushing linebackers from that day going forward. He'd get named the five Pro Bowls, two first-team All-Pros, two second-team All-Pros. Also named NFL Co-Defensive Player of the Year in 1985. He split that with Raiders' Howie Long, who you might see on Fox on every Sunday for football. Tippett put up amazing numbers, and he did it all in those Patriots colors, spending his entire 11-year career. He holds the records for a sack by a Patriot at 100, and he was named to the NFL 1980s All-Decade Team, the Patriots 80s Team, the Patriots All 90s team, the Patriots 35th and 50th anniversary team, and of course he's in the Patriots Hall of Fame. Oh, and he was also inducted to the College and Pro Football Hall of Fame, so he's got a pretty good resume. For this uh, next mention, we're jumping in the time machine. Bill Hewitt, he played defense and on defense and tight end on offense. He played college football with the defending now champions, Michigan. From there, he joined the Chicago Bears and played under coach George Hallis, who said he was fearless. Hewitt was known to refuse to wear a helmet during games, saying it inhibited his play. He played his entire career without wearing a helmet until his last season in the NFL. With the Bears, Hewitt would win two championships, NFL championships. This was before they were called Super Bowls. He made three first-team All-Pros, one second-team All-Pro. And he was thinking about retiring, and then he was traded to the Eagles. He'd get another first-team All-Pro and another second-team All-Pro. And then after being out of football for three seasons, Hewitt returned in 1943 to play fullback for the Steagles. I just learned this. They were a team that was a temporary merger of the Eagles and Pittsburgh Steelers during World War II. That's crazy. Hewitt would retire for good after that season, and then he would sadly pass away in a car crash just four years later. He passed away at the age of 37. Hewitt was named to the 1930s All-Decade team and the NFL 100th Anniversary team. He was also named one of the 100 Greatest Bears of all time, and his 56 is retired by the Chicago Bears, and he's also in the Eagles Hall of Fame. Hewitt was inducted in the Pro Football Hall of Fame 24 years after his passing from that car accident. 
Sticking with players before my time, the next 56 I'll mention is Joe Schmidt. Much like Chris Dolman mentioned on this list, Schmidt paid, played college ball at the University of Pittsburgh. Tremendous leader on that defense and was a captain of the team. He played in the Senior Bowl and was a first-team All-American his senior season. Despite that great resume, Schmidt was in draft until the seventh round of the 1953 draft by the Lions. He joined a Detroit Lions team that had just won the NFL championship the year prior. And some questioned whether the seventh rounder would even make the team. Schmidt did, and he helped make that best defense in the league even better. They win the 1953 NFL championship, and he was a focal point of these great Lions defenses after being elected captain. That following season was probably his best. He helped lead the Lions to their second championship in five years, and... As time wore on, though, Schmidt's body would wear down. It started with a dislocated shoulder picked up in an exhibition game. Then, much like players today, Schmidt and five other Lions were implicated in a gambling investigation by then-Commissioner Pete Rozelle. Schmidt had placed a $50 bet on the Packers to defeat the Giants in that 62 championship game. His teammate, Alex Karras, was given an indefinite suspension, while Schmidt and four other Lions involved were fined two grand each. Schmidt would again dislocate his shoulder, and after a brief comeback, he'd call it a career. He'd retire as a player, and his accolades were pretty good. Two NFL championships, ten Pro Bowls, or eight first-team All-Pros, two second-team All-Pros. Named the NFL 1950s All-Decade team and the 100th anniversary team. The Detroit Lions honored him too, naming him to the pride of the Lions, the Lions 75th anniversary team, the Lions all-time team, and they retired as number 56. Schmidt wore 65 at Pitt, which was also retired. And after his playing days were done, he'd get into coaching, and he'd actually lead the Lions to a playoff to the playoffs following the 70s season. Unfortunately, they follow the Cowboys in a high-scoring 5 nothing game. And then Schmidt left coaching. He actually had a winning record with the Lions. Not a lot of people can see that. Can say that, sorry. But then Joe Schmidt was inducted to the College and Pro Football Hall of Fame, so good on him. The last NFL 56 on this list, someone uh, played during my childhood, so someone not so far back, Pat Swilling. He was a beast at college playing linebacker, killing it at Georgia Tech, setting the NCAA record for sacks in a game with seven. He was voted first-team All-American his last season in college, which led to the Saints drafting Swilling in the third round of the 86th draft. He'd play, playing with the Saints, he'd be part of one of the most feared defenses in the league. In 91 and 92, the Saints had the, probably the best linebacking core in the NFL, known as the Dome Patrol. You may remember me shouting out one of his teammates, Sam Mills, in episode 51. Swilling was first-team All-Pro both those seasons and was named Defensive Player of the Year in 91. With these great defenses, the Saints made the playoffs, but they'd get knocked out in the first round each time. Swelling would then get traded to the Lions, but he would not sign unless the Lions unretired legendary Joe Schmitz, 56, who we just spoke of. Like, how, how petty is that? But he, he'd get his number, he'd play there, he'd help get the Lions to the playoffs, but surprise, surprise, he'd lose in the first round again. He'd end up wrapping his career up with the Raiders, and... He's got that unfortunate record of being 0-6 in all the playoff games he's played. No other player in history has more losses in the postseason without a win. Not a stat you want. But I mentioned his first-team All-Pros and Defensive Player of the Year award. He also led the league in sacks that award-winning season, and he made five Pro Bowls, two second-team All-Pros. His 107 and a half sacks have him 30th on the NFL all-time sack list. He was inducted into the Saints Hall of Fame, and he was also inducted into the College Football Hall of Fame. We're going to leave the football field here. We're going to the baseball diamond. The first 56 that comes to mind, left-handed pitcher Mark Burley. He played high school ball, but he was cut from the team in sophomore season. So after high school, he'd attend Jefferson College in Missouri, and he was later selected in the 38th round of the 98th round. I did not know the rounds kept going by the White Sox. He'd make 36 appearances in the minor before getting the call up. And after a few seasons, he'd make his first All-Star game. And then he'd make his second All-Star game in 2005. And he was a big part of the White Sox going on a very historic run. He'd become the first pitcher in World Series history to start and save consecutive games, doing it in Game 2 and Game 3 of the 05 World Series. Burley's White Sox ended up sweeping the Houston Astros to win the World Series. Burley would continue to suit up for the White Sox, throwing a no-hitter in 2005 seven against the Rangers and throwing a perfect game in 2009 against the Tampa Bay Rays, just the 18th perfect game in MLB history. 
After his fourth All-Star game and back-to-back Golden Gloves, he'd sign a deal to join the Marlins. He'd play just one season there, keeping his Gold Glove Award streak going before getting traded to the Blue Jays. He'd pitch well for the Jays and make his fifth and final All-Star appearance before retiring in Toronto. But he's beloved in Chicago, and the White Sox have retired as number 56. A solid player who, he's more known to get you out by grounding you out or flying you out rather than striking you out, but a very effective pitcher. Sticking with retired pitchers, the next 56 on the list is right-handed reliever Fernando Rodney. The Dominican pitcher got his debut with the Detroit Tigers, where he would grow into a really good pitcher, doing great things from the setup position. He would be a member of the Tigers team that lost the 06 World Series to the Cardinals. When Rodney became a free agent, he'd sign with the Los Angeles Angels, working his way into the closing role. He'd lose that job and look to leave again, where he'd land in Tampa Bay and make his first All-Star game, also winning AL Comeback Player of the Year and Delivery Man of the Year. It was during this time Rodney also fine-tuned his celebration, firing an imaginary arrow to high center field. After a few years in Tampa Bay, he'd sign with the Mariners, leading the AL in saves, earning his second All-Star spot there. Despite going 17-for-17 17 17 in save situations, he was traded to the Miami Marlins, making his third and final All-Star appearance along the way. Rodney would also end up playing for the Diamondbacks, the Twins, the Athletics, most memorably with the Washington Nationals. It was memorable as Rodney would get his first World Series ring at the age of 42, becoming the fourth player to appear in all rounds of the postseason from wildcard to World Series in both the American League and National League. That's got to spin around. That would wrap up his career in the MLB, and then he was pitching in the Mexican League, even leading the league in saves his first season playing, and won reliever of the year. And this was all while playing for the Toros de Tijuana, helping them win the championship. He was released last year, and I think his playing days are done. But we'll always remember his slightly tilted hat. Very memorable pitcher. Wrapping up the MLB portion of the 56 mentions, we'll finish with a current pitcher, St. Louis Cardinal Ryan Helsley. He played college ball at Northeastern State, where he'd get drafted by the Cardinals in the fifth round of the MLB draft. Between working his way up from the minor leagues to dealing with a COVID pandemic, he never really got time to shine. 2022 he did, and he'd make his first All-Star game, as well as getting named to an All-MLB second team. The right-handed pitcher is looking to bounce back this season, and the 29-year-old has lots to give to the organization. We'll see how this year plays out for him. We'll go with the NHL, the first NHL player that comes to mind, the Rock, the 56, is none other than Russian defenseman Sergei Zubov. Driving the fifth round in the 1990 NHL draft by the NHL, the New York Rangers, Zuboff would stay playing for the Red Army's Hus- the Red Army's hockey team. Sorry, went to Moscow. He played there until the disbanding of the Soviet Union. Then he joined the Rangers and become one of the best scoring defensemen in the league, leading the Rangers in assists with 77 and 19 playoff points on the way to the Rangers winning the Stanley Cup. Zubov and teammates Karpatsov, Nemchev, and Alexei Kovalev became the first Russians to have their names engraved on the Stanley Cup. Despite continually playing well for the Rangers, Zubov was traded to the Penguins, but he only lasted one season there. It was reported he bumped heads with Mario Lemieux, and if someone's got to go, it's not going to be Lemieux. So Zubov was traded to Dallas for Kevin Hatcher, and Dallas... Zubov became a staple. He never really reached the same career high in points he had in New York, but those numbers were crazy. He was consistently great, earning all three All-Star nods with the team. He was an important scorer, but just as important on the defensive end, a constant on penalty kills, yet he always had a great good, a great plus-minus. After retiring from the NHL, Zubov would play one year in Russia in the KHL before having to retire with a hip injury. You can't picture those black Dallas Star jerseys without imagining Zubov on the back. He even holds two of the records, points by a defenseman in in regular season play and points by a defenseman in the playoffs, which is why the Dallas Stars have retired Zubov's number 56 and why Zubov was inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. I had to think of some current players to keep this list going. The next 56 is a Finnish forward, Eric Halla. He didn't make the typical Finnish route to the NFL, NHL, playing college ball with the University of Minnesota. He also played some USHL games. After that, he joined the Minnesota Wild, where he was left unprotected in the 2017 expansion draft, and the Vegas Golden Knights picked him up. He played great in Vegas, but he'd move around a bit, playing for the Hurricanes, Panthers, Predators, Bruins. Now he's with the Devils, and he seems to be helping contribute to a team that's trying to get to the playoffs here. 
Going to an even younger player, number 56 for the Kraken, right winger Kyler Yamamoto. He put up pretty good numbers with the Spokane Chiefs, a hometown team for the Washington State-born right winger. This led him to getting drafted 22nd overall by the Edmonton Oilers. He had some up and downs in Edmonton, probably more downs than ups, but he was always working on his game to get better. After his stint in Edmonton, Yamamoto signed a one-year deal to play with the Kraken. He may not be getting all the ice time he desires, but he's still rocking his thing out there. And another shout-out to a 56. So the last NHL mentioned for a 56, another current player, Swedish defenseman Eric Gustafsson. Swedish defenseman was playing professionally in his native land before the Edmonton Oilers selected him fourth in the 2012 NHL draft. After a few more seasons in Europe, his rights not retained by the Oilers, he'd sign with the Blackhawks. He'd have a few good seasons in the Windy City, but couldn't stay that consistent. He ended up playing for the Flames, Flyers, Canadians, Capitals, and Leafs. Now it looks like Eric Gustafson has found a home with the New York Rangers. He's having a pretty decent year, too. The last mention that comes from the hardwood, and it was hard to come by. Number 56, not a popular number on the hardwood. The only one I could find, Dutch baller Francisco Elson. He rocked the 56 his first three seasons in the NBA when he was with the Denver Nuggets. His numbers won't jump at you at all. His best season came after he left the Nuggets, actually, and went to my San Antonio Spurs, where he'd average five points and was a member of the 2007 NBA Championship San Antonio Spurs team, but... He had a different number then. He wore tons of different numbers over his career, but there was one. There was 156 there. So, yeah, that's jerseys. Let's go to the basketball, the thing known as March Madness. We'll start on the men's side in the NCAA basketball tournament. If you had any hope of a salvage bracket in the Sweet 16, you may have been put out of your misery like I was. Number six, Clemson continued their fantastic run, upsetting number two, Arizona, by five points. Your number one UConn Huskies did what they always did in NCAA tournament games. That's crushed their opponents, crushing San Diego State in that rematch of last year's game, beating them by 30. Number four, Alabama would stun number one UNC, killing my bracket. I picked the Tar Heels to win it. Grant Nelson was huge in that win for the Crimson Tide, doing it on both sides of the floor. It was a tough loss for the Tar Heels as R.J. Davis could not hit a shot from outside. It was It was tough. It was the last uh, North Carolina game for Armando Baycott. He was a heck of a career in Chapel Hill. One of the best rounders, this, but one of the best rebounders the school has ever seen. Number three, Illinois would ride a hot hand of Terrence Shannon on their way to beating number two, Iowa State. How about number 11, NC State? They rode the wave of their hot streak starting in the ACC tournament to even get into the big dance. They'd, shark, they'd shock number two, Marquette, with DJ Horn stepping up big in that one. Number one, Purdue would beat up on number five, Gonzaga, with Canadian Zach Eady having another monster game. Number four, Duke would catch a break when number one, Houston, had their leader, Jamal Sheed, go down with a bad injury. And he's the leader of that Cougars team. Once he went out, it totally changed the game. The Blue Devils took advantage. It went down to wire, but Duke pulled it off. Number three, Kate Creighton took on number two, Tennessee, in a great battle. Tennessee's Dalton Connect had a huge game helping guide the Volunteers to a seven-point win. Those big games set up the Elite Eight. Number one, UConn, would again thrash their opponents. Illinois was only down five at halftime. You're like, oh, we got a game. But then the second half, UConn would go on an absurd 30-0 run, absolutely changing the entire game, and the Huskies crushed the fighting Illinois by 25 points. UConn off to the Final Four again. The other matchup was a rare number six versus number four. Clemson and Alabama going at it all game. Clemson had some tough foul trouble, and when P.J. Hall went out of the game, it did not help them. They were in it late, but the toughness of Alabama guard Mark Sears, he's a different maker, a difference maker on both sides of the floor. What a leader this guy is. Bama would hold on for the win, punch their ticket to the Final Four for the first time in program history. Roll Tide. One of the other Elite Eight matches, another doozy. Number two, Tennessee, taking on number one, Purdue. A back-and-forth game that really could have went either way. Dalton Connect would again have a huge game, 37 points. However, big man from Purdue, Zach Eady, an even larger game. The big Canadian again, 40 points, 16 boards. Punching Purdue's ticket to the Final Four. Third time in their program's history and the first since 1980. North Carolina State Wolfpack continued their dream run, beating the De Blue Devils in an all-ACC matchup. 
The Wolfpack would outscore the Blue Devils eight by 18 points in the second half with DJ Burns playing excellent. He'd score 29 points as NC State would go to the Final Four for the fourth time in their history and the first time since they had that magical upset in the National Championship in 1983. That sets up the Final Four next weekend. Number 11, NC State. Don't turn your back on the Wolfpack. They're taking on number one, Purdue, in an old-school battle of some big men. DJ Burns taking on Zach Eady. What year is this, 1990? Our other matchup features number four, Alabama, taking on the juggernaut known as number one, UConn. Those games take place Saturday with the national championship on Monday, April 8th. The women's side, this side's been crazy, y'all. There were games wrapping up in the second round on the day of recording last week. Number four, Indiana, took out number five, Oklahoma. Caitlin Clark and number one, Iowa, took out number eight, West Virginia. Number two, UCLA, won a close one over number seven, Creighton. Juju Watkins and number one, USC, throttled number eight, Kansas. And number four, Gonzaga, beat number five, Utah, to advance. That set up our Sweet 16 matches here. Number three, Oregon State, surprised the Fighting Irish knocking out Hannah Hidalgo and the number two Notre Dame. Number one, South Carolina. They were in a tight battle with number four, Indiana, despite having a massive lead in the first half. The Hoosiers almost pulled it off, but South Carolina held on late. Don Staley had the humbler team a bit after the game in the press conference when Raven Johnson said, how can you guard us? That's how I look at it, which prompted Staley to snap back. We gave up a 17 to 20 point lead. Reminding her team, they haven't done anything yet till you win it. Despite still being undefeated, it's crazy they haven't lost all year. Number three, NC State. They upset number two, Stanford, ending Cameron Brink's collegiate career as a Cardinal. She had a great career, and she's probably going to do well in the WNBA. Number one, Texas would then thump number four, Gonzaga, to advance to the Elite Eight. And then you had number three, LSU, were in a tight battle with number two, UCLA. But the defending champions would hold on to beat the Bruins and advance to the Elite Eight. Number one, Iowa was in a close game for a while with number five, Colorado, until Caitlin Clark turned it up a notch, finishing with 29 points, 15 dimes, and six boards as her Hawkeyes advance. Number one, USC was in a battle with number five, Baylor. Freshman Juju Watkins did, did what she's done all season, finishing with 30 points, six boards, five dimes. She's the future of college hoops for sure. She's something else. Number seven, Duke took on number... Well, she's not the future. She's the now, actually. Let me, let me fix that. Number seven, Duke took on number three, UConn. Duke started off sluggish and couldn't really recover. Paige Beckers was huge again for UConn as she finished with 24 points and five boards. Huskies coach Gino Oriyama only played six players in that win. That's a tight rotation there. So this uh, set up some amazing Elite Eight matchups. You had number one, South Carolina, taking care of the Beavers of Oregon State, punching their ticket to another Final Four. Number three, NC State, much like the men's side, just keeps surprising people. The Wolfpack beat number one, Texas, to get to the Final Four. Their first appearance since 1988, or 1998, sorry. And it's pretty impressive that both the men's and women's program in the Final Four, it's happened a few times, most recently in South Carolina in 2017, but the only school to actually pull off the feet and win both in men's and women's. None other than University of Connecticut, UConn. They've done it twice, once in 2004 and again 10 years later in 2014. But hey, it happened this year in Division II hoops. I haven't followed a lot of that this year, but Minnesota State. How about that? Winning both the men's and women's basketball national championships here. That, that's pretty cool. But back to that NC State-Texas game, that was a weird one. The three-point lines did not match on the court. You had one side of the court with a different line than the other. It was whack. You would never see that in a game. But they said, you know what, we'll play through it. I mean, it's even. You, you ought to take turns on each side. So, excuse me, not a good look for the NCAA there. But, hey, the best matchups are going on tonight when, as this recording is being done. And number three, LSU taking on number one, Iowa, in a rematch of last year's game. Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark both like to chat shit, so it's going to be a dandy. The other matchup between Juju Watkins and number one USC taking on Paige Beckers and number three UConn. This is the hype behind the game we love. I love the attention this game's getting right now. These are going to be some good ones. So number three NC State will take on number one South Carolina in the women's final four on Friday. The other game will be between the two winners of tonight's game. And then the championship will be played next Sunday. So last minute uh, coaching changes in the women's game. Kentucky were able to woo Kenny Brooks away from Virginia Tech. Said to be a five-year deal to join the Wildcats. And it said Kentucky's going to make Brooks the third highest paid coach in the SEC. Just behind LSU's Kim Mulkey and South Carolina's Don Staley. 
But sticking in the SEC, Tennessee fired women's basketball coach Kelly Harper after they were knocked out of the tournament. Harper had been coaching the Lady Volunteers the last five seasons. So that brings us to footy. We had some qualifying fixtures. Let's see, who else could sneak into the European Championship? The Euros are this summer, and there are only a few spots left. Poland would beat Wales in penalties, and Danny James had a soft penalty that was easily stopped. Rough way for Wales to go out. Georgia and Greece would also go to penalty, despite Georgia going down a man in the first half stoppage time with a red card. In penalties, Georgia would prevail and win. The last qualifying spot would be between Ukraine and Iceland. Iceland grabbed the lead in the first half, but two second half goals by Ukraine would punch their tickets to the Euros. That awesome tournament begins on June 14th this summer. There were some friendlies played as well. Jude Bellingham would score uh, basically a goal with the last kick of the match to save a 2-2 draw between England and Belgium. Spain would host Brazil in a thrilling match that would end 3-3. Penalty by West Ham's Lucas Paqueta equaled the game up at 3 in stoppage time. And how about 17-year-old Endrick? He scored a goal at the Bernabeu in Madrid. He just scored a goal in Wembley at the last game, so not a bad start for the teenager in his senior squad career here. Germany would go down a goal to the Netherlands, but they'd come back and take it 2-1. And hey, that's international footy. That's wrapped up. We got league play again. Premier League returned after the international break. It was crazy. With this game between West Ham and Newcastle, iconic St. James, uh, James Stadium, a brutal tackle in the box by Kufal gave Newcastle a penalty, and of course Isaac would score. But then Mikel Antonio would get a perfect pass from Lucas Paqueta, and he'd tie the game up. Then after a call, a foul was called on Newcastle, Cher was kind of laying on the ground holding his head. West Ham's like, whatever, we're going to go. Kudus, Kudus would blast it into the net, giving them a 2-1 lead going into halftime. Areola was kind of injured, so he'd get subbed out for Fabianski, and West Ham was feeling hot. Kudus would find Jared Bowen, who had put West Ham up 3-1 after 48 minutes, but then it kind of looked like West Ham was sitting back a bit. Never a good thing you want to do. Anthony Gordon would go down in the box. VAR looked at it. Calvin Phillips was lining up to kick the ball. And Gordon kind of stuck his foot in the way. So he did get kicked. But I, I didn't like the call. I don't know if it was biased. But Isaac would step up again. And he has not missed a penalty in Newcastle. So, of course, he scored, making it 3-2. Six minutes later, Harvey Barnes got a perfect pass and put it through Fabianski's leg. So now we're all tied up. And it's like, holy shit, this Newcastle crowd's rocking. Harvey Barnes curled up beauty in from outside the box, giving them the 4-3 win. It was, ugh. And the thing is, Thomas Suchek had a chance to head the ball into the net, right? Right at the end of the game, but he decided to try to chest it in, and oh, he chested wrong. It did not go well. Tough loss for West Ham and against Newcastle. Ugh. Chelsea hosted Burnley in a wet one in London. Chelsea had more of the possession, but the game was pretty even. Chelsea had a goal disallowed early with VAR popping in. Mudrick would go on a run and get slightly tugged down. It, it looked like a soft tackle, but Mudrick dropped, and Asinion was assessed a second yellow card, kicking him out of the game. Cole Palmer would score from the penalty spot, as he usually get, does, giving Chelsea the lead going into the break. But just two minutes into the second half, 10-man Burnley would score. Josh Cullen getting his first goal of his Premier League career, and it was a beauty. A wonder strike from outside the box. But Chelsea had the man advantage, and they'd uh, creep, pressuring up again, and Palmer would get his second of the game. And then not even three minutes later, Burnley would tie it up again. O'Shea would head the ball off a corner kick right into the hands of Petrovic. It went right through his hands into the net. Brutal goalkeeping as the match finishes 2-2. Another thrilling match in the Wild Easter weekend was Sheffield United hosting Fulham. After a scoreless first half, things really escalated in the second. Diaz would open the scoring with a wonderful outside the boot cross that found him in the box, but that was a short-lived lead as Fulham's Polina would equalize just four minutes later. He was unmarked off a corner kick. Then we'd get another goal just six minutes later. Fulham would fall asleep and Ollie McBurney would score to go up 2-1. And then two minutes later, Diaz would get his second of the game, putting Sheffield United up 3-1 after 68 minutes. McBurney looked to score again, but VAR would go, uh-uh-uh. And this kind of sparked Fulham, so they'd get a goal back when Cardova Reed would fire in a beauty. And then three minutes in the stoppage time, Rodrigo Munez, who's just been on a, a tear for Fulham, had an insane bicycle kick to tie the game up. And just break the hearts of Sheffield United. All they want is a win, and they just can't get it. But what a wild game. Six goals after the 58-minute mark. 
Crystal Palace would go on the road, taking on Nottingham Forest. The visitors would go ahead when some nice passing led to Mateta getting the ball and firing it home. Forest would then equalize in the 61st minute when a pirouetting Chris Wood would score. He was looking away from the goal, but the way he spun and put enough English on the header, it was wild. That would finish 1-1. Bournemouth hosted Everton, and they'd play to an uneventful first half, but in the second half, things would open up. Solanke would head the ball in the net, giving Bournemouth the lead. Everton would increase their pressure and get a little luck when Bournemouth keeper Nato would just spill the ball. And Beto would knock it in, making it 1-1 at the 87-minute mark. It looked to be a draw. And then a very easy-to-handle cross, or so it seemed easy, was chested into his own net by Seamus Coleman. He's been with Everton for years. What a brutal way to lose in stoppage time. I mean, if Suchek had chested like that, West Ham might have secured a draw. But anyway, Tottenham hosted Luton Town. The visitors... Luton Town jumping out to an early lead. Tahith Chong finding himself up in the box and finishing perfectly three minutes in. Tottenham didn't take well of that and cranked up the pressure. It looked like Sun was going to score, but it hit one post, hit another post, and bounced out. And then it had a shot on the net. Defensive clearance. Defensive. It looked like a game of FIFA, but they couldn't get a goal. Then in the 51st minute, Sun would put a dangerous ball into the box. Kabori didn't have a lot of options. And he chose a bad one, putting it into his own net. So it was 1-1. And it looked like Tottenham was going to go up again, but the, it was cleared off the line, and the goal line technology showed it was just millimeters off. Luton was doing their best to try to secure a draw, but they thought maybe they'd look for a win. They had a corner kick. They'd lose possession. Tottenham and that dangerous counter attack led to Sun putting it away in the 86th minute, giving Tottenham the big comeback win, 2-1. Villa, Aston Villa would host Wolves, and Villa would open the scoring off a nice setup play from a free kick. The ball came to Moussa Diaby, who blasted it home. Then the 65th minute, a looping shot looked like it was going in, but it struck the post and ricocheted in on Villa defender Konsa. He didn't know much about it, but he got the credit for the goal as Villa won 2-0. Brentford hosted Man U, and they looked the better team all game. It was quite amazing, actually, how they could not score. Then the 71st minute, it looked like Ivan Tony put them ahead, but it was ruled off sides. Despite Man United's terrible, lackluster play, they'd open the scoring. Six minutes in the stoppage time, substitute Mason Mount would find the back of the net. It looked like Man U was going to somehow win, but the footy guys would not allow it to happen. Man U was getting outshot 31-11, to 11, so not even three minutes after that goal, Christopher Ayer would equalize. A late push into the box had a perfect pass finding him, tying the game up with like the last kick of the game. Dramatic 1-1 result where Bradford's probably kicking themselves for not getting the win. Liverpool hosted Brighton. were really shocked when Brighton's Danny Welbeck opened the scoring just 84 seconds into the match. Liverpool composed themselves, and they get a little luck to equalize. Off a corner kick, a ball was coming to Brighton defender Veltman, who whiffed on it, and the ball went right past him to Luis, Luis Diaz, who scored. The game remained tied until the 65th minute when some awesome team passing led to Mo Salah finding himself alone, and you knew he'd finish. Liverpool taking the big 2-1 win. And that Liverpool match was a nice appetizer leading up to the main course of the weekend. Defending champions Man City were hosting title hopefuls Ar Arsenal. A lot of hype coming in, which of course led to an uneventful nil-nil match. Man City dominated the ball 73% of the 73 of possession, but they just couldn't get the goal. And for all that hype, it was kind of meh. So we'll look at the table here. We'll see how big those Sunday results were. Liverpool now sits top of the Premier League, 67 points. Behind them is Arsenal with 65. Just behind Arsenal is Man City at 64. All three of those teams have played 29 games, so it's real tight up there. Rounding out the top four is Villa, uh, just outside looking in. Tottenham is three points behind Villa for that last Champions League spot, and they have a game in hand. But unfortunately, this time of the year, we got to look at the bottom of the table, too. And uh, Sheffield United sitting in last with 15 points. They could have used that win. The just above them is Burnley at 18. And Luton Town is tied with Nottingham Forest at 22. But Luton Town's goal differential is a little worse. So they're in the final relegation spot. With under 10 matches to go on the season, teams need to start getting maximized points here. Bundesliga returned as well after the break. Freiburg went on the road and easily took care of Monchengladbach. back. Michael Gregorish opened the scoring in the seventh minute. Then two second half goals, one by Roll and one by Doan, secured the win for Freiburg. Leverkusen went down the 33rd minute to Maximilian Baer. The home crowd was starting to get a little concerned. Then in the 88th minute, a lovely cross led to 
to a Robert Andrich who found the back of the net, tying the game up, and Leverkusen wasn't done there. They've done what they've done all season. That's steal a late win. Who else? Patrick Schick. You'd get the ball in the box and finish, giving Leverkusen their second goal in three minutes, first lead of the match. What a dramatic comeback win for Leverkusen as they beat Hoffenheim 2-1. Still remaining undefeated this season across all competitions. 39 unbeaten. Wow. Ralph Hesenhuttel would manage his first match for Wolfsburg, and they went on the road to take on Werder Bremen. The home side would go a man down when Anthony Young would be the last person back and took down the Wolfsburg player, leading to a direct red card, and Bremen would go down to 10 men. This inspired the visitors, and Maxens Lacroix would have his deflected shot beat the keeper. And they, This game stayed that way until we had another red card handed out. This time the Wolfsburg goal scorer, Lacroix, as he took down a player that could have broken away for a goal scoring opportunity. I thought it was a harsh call. Call, and it's only the third dismissal of Lacrosse Bundesliga career. But so we'd have two teams of 10 men. Bremen looked to equalize, but only had the ball cleared off the line, and that was huge as Wolfsburg would double their lead. Lavro Mayer would chip the keeper. It was a beautiful chip, and Wolfsburg would win 2 0, securing the win in Coach Heisenhutl's debut. I am butchering that name, by the way. One of the biggest matches of the weekend Bayern Munich hosting Borussia Dortmund. On a Dortmund counterattack, Eddie Yemi would open the scoring for the visitors on really their first attack of the game just for the 10 minute mark. And then Bayern, they tried. They had tons of the ball, but Dortmund would double their lead in the 83rd minute when substitute Sebastian Hilaire would find Julian Ryerson. He'd bury the goal to make it 2-0. Harry Kane looked to get one back for Bayern, but VAR uh, 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 ruled offside. 2-0 win for Dortmund, their first win in Bayern Munich since 2014. Amazing. The rest of the German top flight was uh, finished with a bunch of draws. Eintracht Frankfurt, Union Berlin would play to a scoreless draw. Frankfurt with a few more chances in the tie. Uh, Leipzig versus Mainz would have the same result. Leipzig had 67% of the ball but could not find a goal. Augsburg hosting Köln and both teams exchanged first half goals in the 1-1 tie. Uh, Bochum looked on their way to cruising over Darmstadt. Um, two goals in 14 minutes by Tim Skark and Oscar Wilhelmsen tied the game up for Darmstadt and that's how the game would end. Great showing by the bottom of the table, Darmstadt, as they look to continue playing next season in the Bundesliga. Looking at the table, Leverkusen almost had the championship wrapped up. They have a 13-point cushion at the top of the standings. They have 123 and tied four in their 27 fixtures. Like I said, unbeaten. Bayern Munich followed their loss to Dortmund, following their loss to Dortmund, sorry, sit 13 behind, points behind the leaders. Stuttgart sits in third spot, three points behind Bayern Munich. Sorry, I forgot to mention that Stuttgart drew with Heidenheim there. Uh, they sit in third spot, three points behind Bayern. Dortmund is now in the fourth spot, three ahead of Leipzig, who are now on the outside looking in after their draw with Mainz. Looking at the relegation zone, Darmstadt are in the basement with 14, Köln just ahead of them at 19, and Mainz are in that relegation playoff spot with 20 points. Six back of Bochum, so that could be tough to catch. And remember, Germany is a little different than the Premier League. The bottom... In the Premier League, the bottom three teams are relegated. In Germany, the bottom two are relegated. And the 16th seed plays the third place seed from the, t the league below. Winner stays in the Bundesliga. I kind of like that. The Spanish top division kicked off this past weekend following that international break. Things kicked off with Cadiz hosting Granada, a relegation battle that was dominated by the home side. After a scoreless first half, Robert Navarro would get the ball into the box and blast it past the keeper. And that was the only goal of the game as Cadiz win 1-0. As we go on to the weekend, we'd have another 1-0 result. This time, visiting Sevilla would go in the Getafe's house and take the win. 38-year-old Sergio Ramos would score off a corner kick, and that'd be the only game in the match, despite Getafe having most of the ball. Sergio Ramos reminding everyone that he still got it. Almeria hosted Osasuna, and the bottom side of the table had some struggles. Visiting Osasuna scored two goals in the first nine minutes, a lovely finish by Arnaiz, and then an easy tap-in by Budimar, following some bad defense and passing by Almeria. And then another bad mistake by the Almeria defense led to Munoz scoring, giving Osasuna the 3-0 win. Barcelona hosted Las Palmas, and the home side had an early goal overturned by VAR. And then the game would really shift when Barca would go on the attack again. And on the race for the long ball, Las Palmas' keeper, he was not beating Rafinha to that ball. He tried, but he took Rafinha out, who did a little spin in the air. 
Valles was given a red card and the visitors were down a man. Barcelona would crank it up but not get a goal till the 59th minute. Went off a free kick, a wonderfully timed run and pass, led to Rafinha getting the header right into the top corner. A big 1-0 win for Barcelona. Girona hosted Real Betis in a, ju a juicy matchup. The home side getting a first half penalty chance when VAR found a handball. I mean, it hit his hand, but I didn't think he intentionally meant to do it. It was a tough call. But regardless, Dovic would step up and score from the spot to put Girona up after 36 minutes. Some dreadful passing by Girona led to Willie and Jose getting the ball, and he'd loop it over the keeper. Easy one to tie the game up. Then some more lovely passing led to Dovbik's second goal of the game, put Girona up again. But again, Betis would equalize, and again it'd be Willie and Jose. A cross was handled terribly by Girona defense, and the Brazilian would score his brace. The game seemed destined for a draw until two minutes in the stopping time. Christian Stuani's first shot was stopped, but he just got enough on the rebound to put it past the line, giving Girona the huge 3-2 win. Real Sociedad would secure a road win over Alaves in the 59th minute when John Pacheco would get a low header off a corner. That'd be the only goal in the game as Real Sociedad dominated the game. Real Madrid hosted Athletic Bilbao in a highly anticipated match. Rodrigo would add magic to the match just after the seven-minute mark when he'd curl a beauty into the goal to give Madrid the 1-0 lead. Rodrigo would then get his brace in the 73rd minute when he'd be left all in his lonesome on the counterattack and he'd put it away. Villarreal hosts Atletico today to wrap up the match week. There is a makeup game this upcoming Thursday between Granada and Valencia going down as well. We'll hop to the La Liga table. Real Madrid sits atop the top of the league with an eight-point cushion over second-place Barcelona. Two points behind Barca is a surprising Girona squad. Athletic Bilbao sits in fourth as of this recording, but they only have a one-point lead over Atletico Madrid, who with a win could jump over them and get into that top four. Bottom of the table, Almeria and Granada are deep in the relegation zone. Cadiz sit at in 18th with 25 points, just three behind Celta Vigo, who are above them in the relegation spot. To Italy, they kicked off with Napoli hosting Atalanta, a match that we were expecting to be close, but it was anything but. Miranchuk, uh, Miranchuk would put the visitors ahead in the 26th minute with a scrappy goal, and then just before halftime, short stint in West Ham player Samaka would effortlessly, effortlessly slot one home to double the Atalanta lead. In the second half, Napoli was turning it up, and they'd get some good chances, hitting the post, but forcing great saves. But Atalanta would get the third goal, Coop Miners would finish it wonderfully, and they'd get the 3-0 win over Napoli. Torino hosted Monza, and the home side would get a penalty chance in the second half when they were pulled down in the box. Antonio Senebria would step up and convert from the spot, putting Torino up 1-0. Uh, not even three minutes later, Matteo Pessina would receive his second yellow card. Monza would go to bed down, which would not help them as they lost 1-0. Lazio would host Juventus in a big match as it would be Igor Tudor's first game managing Lazio after Maurizio Sarri resigned following the team's fifth loss in six games. This managing move seemed to have sparked the home side despite their ball dominance and uh, they, this game looked uh, destined for a draw. Then in stoppage time, substitute Matteo Guenduzzi crossed the ball, the fellow substitute Ciro Immobile, who headed the ball past the keeper, giving Lazio the perfect start for new managers. They take the 1-0 win. Another great match in Italy at Fiorentina hosting AC Milan. After a goalless first half, we'd get a plethora of goals in a short frame. Three goals in less than six minutes. First, Milan would go on the attack and a lovely back heel by Raphael Leo found Loftus-Cheek, who put them ahead. And not even three minutes later, Alfred Duncan would score from outside the box to tie it up. And then another three minutes, another goal. Leo would go on a long run and finish masterfully. Two big 2-1 win for AC Milan. There was one draw in the Serie A before recording. It was between Genoa and Frosinone. That home side would get a penalty opportunity. Goodmanson would score. And that lead was short-lived when Renier Jesus would respond, giving Frosinone the tie. And that's how the game would finish. There were games today. I managed to see them and sneak them in here. Bologna skunked Salernitana 3-0. Inter Milan got goals from DeMarco and Sanchez. They beat Empoli 2-0. The other match is finished in draws with Cagliari drawing 1-1 with Verona. Sassuolo drawing 1-1 with Udinese. And Lecce and Rome playing to a scoreless draw. So you look at the table, Inter Milan, that massive 14-point lead over second place AC Milan. And Milan's hot streak of late has them making an even larger gap between them and third place Juventus. And Bologna is just two points behind Juventus to round out the top four. Taking us to France, the French division kicked off with Lille hosting Lons. The home side would get two goals from Zagrova to go up 2-0 after the 60th minute mark. Lons would get one back through Wahi, but they'd fall short as Lille took the 2-1 win. 
Monaco went on the road to take on Metz, getting three goals by three different players in the first 16 minutes. That really set Monaco up, and they cruised in the 5-2 win. Lorient would hold Brestois, and it looked like they were the better team. But the first goal would come in the 86th minute by Brestois and by Castillo. The Brestois striker, uh, Barahimi, would pick up a late red card for kind of just lashing out at a player. It was late. It didn't cost them. Brest take the big 1-0 win. Nice would host Nantes in a big matchup. Nantes would go up in the first half when Albine would score a lovely header. Then we wouldn't see any more goals to the second half. After a tangling of feet, Nice would go down in the box and get awarded a penalty. Moffy would step up and score from the spot. And then minutes later, Abline would go on a great run getting taken down in the box. And this time Mustafa Muhammad would score, putting Nantes up for good as they leave with a 2-1 road win. Toulouse would go on the road and thump Clermont Foot 3-0. And an early penalty by Sierra put the visitors up. And then two goals and six minutes late sealed the win for Toulouse. Montpellier went on the road to take on Le Havre and picked up a big 2-0 win. Jordan Ferry and Christopher Julian scoring goals within eight minutes of each other to secure the win. Big win for Montpellier in the table as they leapfrog Le Havre. Much like other fixtures in this week, a game was decided with two quick goals. Strasbourg hosted Rennes and got goals by Sinea and Sebastian just two minutes apart, but his Strasbourg had two goals after 73 minutes. That was enough to give the home side the 2-0 win. Oh, sorry, I need a sip there. Lyon hosted Reims in a great game. A little bit of a frenzy in the Lyon box led to Akumu scoring and putting Reims ahead after 55 minutes. Not even 10 minutes later, Lyon would respond. Former West Ham man Saeed Benrama, lovely cross in, and Nuama would head the ball in, time the game at one, which is how it would end. The weekend wrapped up with Marseille hosting PSG in a much-anticipated match. PSG had most of the ball to start. When Marseille looked to counter, Lucas Beraldo took out a bombing, leaving the VAR intervening and having a straight red card giving, putting PSG a man down before halftime. But early in the second half, a bad giveaway led to a PSG counterattack, and they'd convert with Vitinha finding the back in the net. Giancarlo, Giancarlo Ramos would add a late goal for the icing on the cake as PSG went 2-0, despite being a man down the whole second half. Looking at the table, PSG has really run away with the league as they have a 12-point cushion over second-place Brestois, who are and they're sitting in third, just one point behind Brest, is Monaco. And then Lille round out the top four, just three points back in Monaco. On the MLB season, yeah, it's opening day. Great to see baseball back. A few last-minute signings for opening day. L.A. Dodgers finalized a 10-year, $140 million contract extension for catcher Will Smith, who was getting jiggy with it. Also World Series winning pitcher Jordan Montgomery signing a one-year, $25 million deal to join the Diamondbacks, who they had beaten the World Series. The Blue Jays split their series in Tampa, each team picking up two wins. In the third game of that series, we had a nice little shove by pitcher Genesis Cabrera, which caused the dugouts to clear. Nothing really happened after that, which surprised me when I'd hear Cabrera received a three-game suspension for his involvement. The Yankees swept the Astros to start the season. The Brewers swept the Mets, and the Pirates swept the Marlins. Those were some one-sided series, but most of our eyes have been on those Dodgers. It's just amazing to see the 1-2-3 MVP opening lineup of Mookie Betts, Shohei Otani, and Freddie Freeman. Oh, man, there's going to be something to watch all season. It's just great having baseball back. Looking forward to some more games. To a season that's starting, now to a season that's kind of wrapping up. The, the NHL is getting closer to wrapping up. The Dallas Stars, I mentioned them in Zuboff's piece earlier, they're getting hot at the right time. Seven-game winning streak, and they have shot up the Central Division standings. Colorado Aver Avalanche were on a little bit of a run on their own on a nine-game winning streak before losing two in a row. They got back on winning ways, beating the Predators in a huge comeback win. Stars and Avalanche are both clinch playoff spots, while the Winnipeg Jets are free-falling. Falling Jets, not good. Losers of six in a row. Current longest streak in the league. They really need to turn things around. Luckily for them, the Preds have lost two in a row as well in the division. Oh, in the Pacific, the Canucks are still the only team to have currently clinched a postseason spot. The Edmonton Oilers are clinching or inching closer to that status as they have won three in a row. But the Golden Knights, they're winners of two in a row as well. It's trying to keep up. Both teams trying to get that playoff spot lined up. I know it hasn't been the Seattle Krakens here thus far, but they've called up 2022 fourth overall pick Shane Wright to finish the season. He's some big time moments for the 20 year old who hasn't quite lived up to that hype. We had a happy moment that's been an otherwise disappointing season for the Coyotes. Coyote legend Shane Doan watched his son Josh make the debut for the team, and he didn't watch him just score once. He saw him score twice. 
becoming the first player in franchise history to record multiple goals in their debut. And the Coyotes actually got the win over the Blue Jackets. But we'll head out east. There are a few teams that have clinched playoff spots in the Atlantic. The division-leading Bruins have their ticket punched, as well as the Florida Panthers. The Maple Leafs and Lightning are in a battle for that third spot. Both teams are on short winning streaks. Toronto's Austin Matthews scored his 60th of the year. 60th goal of the year, guys, and his 3-0 win over the Sabras, <laughs> Buffalo Sabres. Matthews became just the ninth player in NHL history with multiple 60-goal seasons. We were witnessing greatness, y'all. The lowly Senators have kind of turned things around, winning five in a row, too. That's Didn't see that coming. In the Metropolitan Division, the division-leading Rangers have clinched their spot as well as the Carolina Hurricanes. The Washington Capitals and my Philadelphia Flyers are tied for the third spot in the division, both on losing streak. Streaks, Washington loses at their last two, while Philly have lost four in a row, and they need to turn things around. So things are getting tighter in the NHL with less uh, nine or less games to be played. Looking at the stats, Colorado's Nathan McKinnon, he's back at the top of the points list, leading the league with 127. He's continuously changed spots with Tampa Bay's Nikita Kucherov, who is just one point back. But look out for Edmonton's Connor McDavid. He's closed the gap, and he's just two behind McKinnon with 125. And McDavid is just four assists away from hitting that 100 assist mark. That's crazy. Goal leaders, the before-mentioned Austin Matthews with 60 goals. Edmonton's Zach Hyman is 52, and Florida's Sam Reinhardt is 51. Sam Reinhardt. Looking at the goaltending stats, Carolina's Peter Kochikov has the best goals against average, slightly better than Florida's Sergei Bobrovsky, who's still on the case. Winnipeg's Connor Hellebuck leads the league in save percentage, and Colorado's Georgia leads the NHL in wins. Not much change with our rookie leaders. Number one overall pick, Connor Bedard, still leading rookies in points with 57 and goals with 21. We got our first look at the UFL, the merging of the XFL and USFL. They had a baby, UFL. Their games open up. You had the Birmingham Stallions beating the Arlington Renegades. The Michigan Panthers beat the St. Louis Battlehawks with, get this, a 64-yard game winner by Jack Bates. This kicker, he had not attempted a field goal in a game since high school. And that gave him the 18-16 win. And let me repeat, a 64-yard game winner. Yeah, that happened. The San Antonio Brahmas beat up on the D.C. Defenders, defenders, and the Memphis Showboats beat the Houston Roughnecks. Still weird to have spring football on, but we'll see how this league holds up compared to leagues of uh, years past. Not a sport I normally cover, but I had to mention this here, the Barkley Marathon. With just 90 seconds to spare, Jasmine Paris became the first woman to ever complete the Barkley Marathon. I had to look this race up a bit. It consists of five loops of 20 miles plus off-trail course for a total of 100 miles. It's limited to a 60-hour period from the start of the first loop. This is an insane race, which only 20 people have ever completed in the time allotted. And Paris became the first female to ever complete that feat. So congrats that's amazing one last mention here in the nfl they voted on changing the kickoff rules the new rule says that nine players from the return team will be in the setup zone the two returners will be in the landing zone which is between the 20 yard line and the goal line the kicker has to kick the ball within that 20 yard line and the game can only start when the ball hits the ground or is touched by a player in the landing zone try to stay with me once you see it in action it makes a little more sense and this is all in the name of safety to avoid high-speed collisions. I get that. It's just it's kind of weird looking. We'll see how it goes. <clears throat> Excuse me. We did have another rule change, though. It's involving tackling. The hip drop tackle where you wrap someone up and kind of use your weight to pull them down, that is no longer allowed. It has been banned. It has led to some injuries recently, but it's also caused some kickback from some former players NFL player, former NFL player J.J. Watt tweeted, just fast forward to the belts with flags on them. So a lot of mixed reactions. I'm not going to lie, most of them negative and mostly from the defensive side. But we'll see what happens with that. What a damn week of sports, I'm telling you. And those games are going on. You better be watching women's hoops right now or when you've done this, I guess. But as I'm struggling to finish typing this out, I was struggling to finish typing this because... Little Nermal was on the case. I mentioned Nermal. Nermal's our girl, our kitty cat. <clears throat> Let's talk about Nermal real quick, our dope-ass kitty. A lot of people were off work during COVID times. I was one of them. Finding more time around the home. You know, you go outside, and there'd be a kitty. And like, oh, hey, little kitty. And, of course, you know, wife sees the kitty. She's feeding the kitty cat. Suddenly there's another. 
And it was like DJ Khaled was in her backyard with kitties because there's another one, another one, and all these kitties. And we go outside to go to the car hole to have a hoot ski. Make sure you feed the horde of kitties. They were so adorable. We had names for all of them. It was glorious. You'd come outside and they'd emerge, They'd popping out of trees. It was wild, but you know, real realism kicked in. It's like, this isn't sustainable to keep feeding six cats in the backyard. We can't bring them in. We have a relatively small home, you know, the square footage, the kitty ratio, some bad maths right there. We knew we had to do something and, you know, we wanted a kitty. So there's one kitty that spent tons of time with us. She'd come in, called street cat. They were full. We called animal control, figure out a game plan, borrowing a big animal crate, set it up in the car hole. Animal control said we had to trap the kitties because they can't pick them up. So if we trapped them, they'd come pick them up. So we used food, lured the kitties into the crates. They cried. Animal control got there. He picked them up one by one, putting them in the crates, putting them in the vehicle. They were sad. I felt awful. I felt like I was betraying our little four-legged friends, you know, but... There's so much traffic in her neighborhood. One cat was very pregnant. If she wasn't, I apologize. But she looked very pregnant. We knew the right thing would do was to get them off the streets, get them set up. But man, it was it was rough. I was getting super emotional about it. You know, we these were our kitty cats. These were our backyard cats. But we did keep one. Normal. She's come in. She's been the awesome, the dopest cat when I come home from work. Well, after the wife feeds her, she demands she gets fed first. But then when I sit down, she wants that recliner up. She wants to sit and cuddle. So happy to have that cat in her lives. I'm telling you, shout out to Nermal, even though she makes it tough to record this sometimes. But that's episode 56, y'all. It's in the books. We did it. Lots of sports to cover. Lots of Nermal to cover. All that good stuff. You better be putting that Elite Eight matches on right now. Angel going up against Clark. That's just going to be wild. Then follow it with Juju against Paige. Oh, my goodness. I'm loving how we're talking basketball. You go back 10 years, people are not talking about women's basketball. They're talking about women's basketball now. But how do you show the game? If you show it, we will walk. Hopefully that's what you're doing with my podcast. So thanks again for coming out. Red City out.